Liz, before y'all go, there's a couple of things I'd like to do before y'all leave. I, I, I was going to go ahead and do it, but I, I, I want the girls to be okay. witness of this. Let, let's all stand and let's set the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Okay, let's do that. I, I'm sure the girls probably, or hopefully, say the pledge at school, or Avery will one day, but uh, I, I want them to be exposed to this. You remember when you went to school, you did it every morning? We did. All right, attention, salute, and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, you can be seated. One other thing I want to, there's a video on the desktop there, Carter, called, it's about flying a kite. Bring the lights down and bring that up. I don't think we need the audio for that. But uh, surprisingly, uh, we had Avery's, Therese had a nice party prepared for Avery's fourth birthday yesterday. There's probably more birthday to go on. And uh, she got a kite for her birthday. And coincidentally, it's part of my sermon today. So click play there. Let's, let's see that. There's a little girl right there. Children's Corner. Cute as a button. There she is flying a kite. <laughs> or it's flying her. I don't know. An affordable kite. I, I remember we used to be able to go to Freeman's Grocery and they had a whole box full of them there and I probably you could buy them for a dollar and a half, two dollars, and uh, probably nickel for a spool of string. There's her mommy. I want to think that was Angry Bird or something. That, that's a cartoon character. I can't think of his name. Addison, do you know who that bird is on the kite? He plays, he looks like he's dressed like a detective or something. Duck. It's a, it's a help to have someone to throw it up in the air. There we go. You got the idea. Oh, no. It almost took off there. Try again. She's not going to turn it off. Face it the right way. And there it goes. You got to have a little bit of wind. Turn it backwards and it goes Yeah, there you go. Flying up in the air. And I, there was a field. There wasn't anything in this field. They were right behind Freeman's Grocery. They're all, all off of Mill Road in Flint. And it was a long ways to trees, and it was a long ways to power lines. It was just a perfect place to go. And we would meet there every every time. I, I say summer, but it was usually in the spring when the March winds were about. And we'd get four or five spools of string, pipe string. And when you went around out, you could tie the next roll to the cardboard holder for that string and run that up, and you could see that cardboard sleeve go all the way up. And our object was to fly that kite completely out of sight. So you can see that string going off and maybe see one or two spools. Thank you, Carter. Y'all can go to uh, Children's Church now. Have a good time. Thank you so much. But you can feel the tension and the pull on that string, and that kite would be completely out of sight. I don't know if you played with kites when you were little. And uh, I never have, can remember having built a kite. We seemed like, you know, like I said, for a dollar and a half or Dollar seventy-five. You get a really nice kite with almost anything on it that you wanted to portray, and all the string, and it was something you could do for the whole day and just just fly those kites. Don't know if you did that or not. Mom would always help us. Uh, she, uh, the only the only thing we needed to do bring uh, in our back pocket that, that what they didn't sell at the store usually was a tail. We'd make that out of a torn up uh, t-shirt or something like that. It had some three or four knots in it, usually about seven or eight, eight or ten feet worth of tail. Just let that thing take off. If you didn't do that, boy, you missed a part of your childhood that maybe you can still redeem and still go get it. Well, I'm glad that you're here today. There's a lot going on. Please be careful out there. There are, there are all kinds of people, you know, they celebrate in a lot of different ways. And uh, we, were, we, were, we were right at the edge of where a whole lot of people were in Morgan County yesterday. And then after we, the old people left, uh, Carice took the, the girls and their other guests to the children. I think they probably went to the where, where everybody was swimming, and that, that probably was hot, and a lot of noise going on, and a lot of splashing. Thank God we weren't required to be at that. But uh, celebrating our nation's independence. It's a, it's a wonderful time. It's just something I think that people, many, many people in our country, our nation, have lost sight of or don't comprehend or don't un understand. 
and uh, it grieves my heart sometimes. Let's go on. We're in the fourth part of what shall this man do uh, this morning. Let's go on, Carter. Let's, let's advance a little bit. I've introduced a concept that's related to a verse of Scripture that Paul delivered in Corinthians. He says that God leads us in triumph in Christ. And what that means is it's, it's a reference that everybody knew. Whenever the Roman Empire had a great military victory, they'd have a parade. And part of that parade was running their chariots through the streets with, with all of their uh, enemies chained in a procession to the back of the chariot. And it was called a triumph. A triumph. And, and it's a, a particular word, a particular description. And, and they had this kind of thing all the time. They, and that's really one thing that we do at church is we celebrate our victories. We, and, and your testimony is, God answered my prayer. Or God led me. God gave me peace in a difficult time. I hope if, if something is stirring in your heart or something God has done in your life, you don't have to be an eloquent speaker or, or uh, even feel comfortable at talking. But if, you ever, if God does something in your life, tell us. Tell the members of your Sunday school class. Raise your hand and say, Brother John, I, I got a word of testimony. It, it could be much more powerful than any message that I could ever preach. That's often the case. What God's doing in your life may have nothing to do with a sermon, but it may touch someone in a very special, powerful way. Something, some way God's blessed you or something that God taught you during the week. You're reading the Bible or reading a, a passage from a, a devotional book and God spoke to you and something, meant, something important to you. Always feel free to share those things because that's our parade. That's our parade. But Paul says, let's look at that verse of Scripture. Let's go on. It's in 2 Corinthians 2.14 where Paul says, Thanks to God who is leading us in triumph in Christ. He says, Jesus has overcome us. He beat us. <laughs> There's a, a poem by St. Uh, Coleridge entitled, The Hound of Heaven. The Hound of Heaven. And it tells in poetic form about how God was chasing him like a hound dog. Oh, God, he was after me and I was running from him. I was trying to get away and God wanted to connect with me. He was, he's trying to get his arms on me. And he said he followed me and this poem just only even chased me here. He chased me there. I hid here, I hid there. And finally, I just fell to my knees and I, I gave my life to Jesus. It's a wonderful poem. We don't read much poetry anymore. But Jesus has to become the Lord of our life. And that... We have to surrender to it. Listen, he says, he's, God is leading us in triumph in Christ and spreading the fragrance of our knowledge of Him everywhere we go. Remember in the parade, the only way to make those old streets smell good was by littering them with flower petals. And so as these parades come through town, there was music for the ears. There were flower petals for the nose. And then for the eyes, there was this sight of all these people marching along behind the chariot. These are the people that we overcame. Paul says, I'm glad that Jesus overcame me. Remember that old story back in the Old Testament where it says Jacob wrestled with a man all night long. Well, I'll let her find out. He called that name, the name of that place, Peniel. Peniel, which is Hebrew for the face of God. Because he said, I have seen the face of God, and yet I'm still alive. So the person he was wrestling with was God. We all wrestle with God. We all, you know, the Bible says we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. And I know a lot of times we think, he says, well, he's talking about wrestling with the devil. Well, you know, I told you my testimony. I wrestle with God when I wrestle with the devil. The devil don't even know my name. Anybody don't know where I'm at. The Lord Jesus knows me. And he knows you intimately, personally. I heard Adrian Rogers, the late great pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis many years ago, preach a sermon called, he titled it, A Fight You Can't Afford to Win. A fight you can't afford to win. It's fighting with God. He has to overcome us. Let me show you something else. Go on there, Carter. Here's Ron Dunn. I put his sermon on Facebook for you to see if you care to take it. I really, if there's any way, if you want to hear it and you don't have Facebook or a computer, to connect to the internet if you'd like to hear Chained to the Chariot, Ron Dunn's famous sermon on 2 Corinthians 2.14. I'll get it to you somehow. And he says in this sermon, 
as a Christian, you're only experiencing as much victory in Jesus as Jesus is experiencing victory over you. Well, that, is, that really, that's a sermon right there in a, in a nutshell. You, as a Christian, are only experiencing as much victory in Jesus as Jesus is experiencing victory over you and over me. He has to overcome me. He has to wrap me up. He has to hog tie me. And we don't holler. You know, I don't know what y'all did on the playground. Did y'all ever, did you ever have someone hold you down and make you cry, uncle? I don't know what that was about. Hey, uncle. What else did they say? Remember? Casserole. Casserole. Say, how oh, casserole. Man, I don't, I don't know what it means. Casserole. That's the way of tapping out. I'm done. I, I give up. Jesus gets a hold of me and he says, Uncle, cry uncle. Casserole. Let's go on. When I entered the ministry, Long, long time ago, I, I'd hear people tell you, talk about somebody surrendered to preach. Didn't have a U in it, just a S-R-U. Surrendered. I surrendered to preach. Well, I surrendered to preach. I didn't know it. I thought I just got saved. But at about the same time, probably the very moment when I gave my life to Christ, I surrendered to preach too because I had a heart that was saying, I'll just, do, just tell me what you want me to do. And I know that you've talked to the Lord too and you want to, please him. And that's really what this series is about. What shall this man do? Lord, what do you want me to do? And it's more important than what God wants that other person to do. Even your husband or your wife. Even members of your family. What does God want you to do? And then you're never going to get to a place where you say, well, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I finished. Whew. Boy, you know, you ever heard of Calvinism? The old Calvinists one time, he was, they believed whatever's going to happen is going to happen, you know. They used to, when the, when the Baptists believed that away, strictly, they called us hard shell Baptists. Old Calvinist, he fell down a flight of stairs. Just boom, bang, boom, boom, like that, fell down the bottom. He got up, dusted himself off, and he says, well, thank God that's over with. Whew. Got that behind him. Surrender. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German pastor. He spoke out in the heart of World War II against Adolf Hitler. And then, because he spoke out, his life was in danger. And he went to England. He went and he ran and he got away. He got away. He escaped to Germany. But he couldn't stand it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you ever get a chance, he's written some of the most wonderful books about faith in Christ, about being the church, and about who we are as the children of God in a difficult time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said these words. He says, when Christ calls us, he calls us to come and die. Come and die. Well, Bonhoeffer went back to Germany. He couldn't stand it. He went back. He was sent into a concentration camp, and there he died. There's a great deal he expects of us often, and uh, it's not always rosy. It's not always wonderful. There's a great deal of celebration, but he has triumph over us, and sometimes he expects of us more than, not only more than we have, and all that we have, but more than we have and all that he's put into us. Well, in order to be involved in that, he is saying, I'm, I want to free you so that you can be enslaved to me. I want to chain you to me. I want me and you to be connected. I want us to be attached. I want to obligate you and let you know that you have responsibility, that I'm yours and you're mine. It involves surrender. Just as he gave us the example of what he surrendered to, what he submitted himself to for us, as he's our Lord and Master, we must surrender to him. And that's where our, our lives will find joy and fulfillment. It's not always pleasant, but more often than not, it's glorious. To be able to do something that Jesus says, would you do this for me? And we can say, Lord, for with all that you've done for me, how could I say no? Let's go on. There's Paul. Remember, he was arrested when he went to Jerusalem, and they sent him to Caesarea. And then they brought him back from Caesarea to appear before these, these royal people. <laughs> There's a Festus there on the left. And there's King Agrippa, that's him in the center, and his sister, Bernice. 
So there's all three of them. They're hearing Paul. Let's bring him in. Let's, let's let him have his say. He had appealed to Caesar, and they, they were... They really uh, wanted to hear what he had to say. They were trying to find a way. Remember Pilate was trying to let Jesus go? Trying to find a way to get rid of Jesus and he couldn't? Well, that's what they... They already know that Paul has appealed to Caesar. There's really nothing they can do. They have a, an imperial obligation to get Paul to appear before Nero, the emperor. But there he is, and he's talking to them. Remember, Agrippa said, well, Paul, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. Paul said, well, he says, King Griffin, he said, I wish that you were all, not only almost persuaded, but all together persuaded to be like me. Can you imagine telling the king, I wish you were like me? He's in chains. That's brought him up out of the dungeon. He says, I wish you were almost and all together like me except for these chains. You might think that Paul is in bondage, that he's been captured. That he's under arrest, that he's a prisoner, but he's actually been given the freedom and the liberty to do just exactly what God wants him to do. He's been given the opportunity to talk about Jesus and to talk about eternal salvation to King Agrippa and to the prelate Festus. And there's no doubt, no question, there were a lot of other important people allowed into court that day, and they were hearing what Paul had to say. Paul had a good idea about a good ministry, but it didn't open up all the possibilities. You see, Paul has preached to thousands, and now he's just talking to a small room full of people. But he's just exactly where God wants him to be, doing what God wants him to do. And those chains represent the fact that Jesus overcame him, and Jesus triumphed over him. And now, He's not doing what Paul wants to do. He's doing what Jesus wants him to do. And it's very, very important. Now, let's go on. Let me show you a few things here. There's that kite. Imagine yourself being a kite for just a few minutes. You know what that kite is thinking? I tell you what he's thinking. I know what he's thinking. He's just like me. Sure do wish I could get loose. I'm tied up. I'm tied down. I'm anchored to the earth. I just wish that I could get away. I'm thinking about running off. I'm thinking about, I wish I was free. I had a few kites get loose. They didn't go up into the heavens. They didn't soar off into the sunset. You know what they did? They crashed. They crashed. Now, that's what I'm telling you about now. That tail on there is to propose a, a, a counterweight. It is to hold it so that it only faces one, up in one direction and in one, in one orientation. That, that tail has some weight and holds it down. If you didn't have a tail, now there are all different kinds of kites that are designed like wings and they don't need a tail. But, but, but a kite that's designed like that one uh, needs a tail. Not a, not a, a, I've seen box kites. have no idea how those things work. Never had one. They didn't interest me for some reason because I've seen many of them fly and I just say, I just don't think I'm going to fly. <laughs> Box kites. Very interesting though. But the, you can tell that the tail was always about as heavy as the kite itself. And it seems sometimes that maybe it was almost even heavier than the kite itself. It seemed like something that was a, I knew that even in a, as a little boy, I knew that it was a weight. I knew that it was holding it down, and anything like that, you'd say, well, how am I going to get it up in the air if it's got a long tail like that that's so heavy that it might hold it down? Another thing, too, is that that string right there pulls it, and it controls it. It restrains it, and it does anchor it. But here's the principle. There are many, 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 the, the principle for all human life and for a great many other aspects of anything that's living or alive. It is very often the constraints. We can talk about the laws of nature, gravity, and the sun rising and setting, and the stars in the sky. We think about science and different things that govern the universe, the orbit, uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun. All those different 
rules and laws of physics and physical nature, we know, we should know, that it is very often the constraints, the boundaries, the streams that actually make things work, that make things possible. It is the weight which holds it down and the string which holds it down that allows it to fly. And without those two things, it will crash. Often there are times in our life when you and I wish that we were free or that something wasn't holding on to us or something wasn't holding us down or holding us back. Lord, I can have a happy life if only I didn't have these weights in my pockets. If I had more money, if I was better looking, how many times have I prayed that prayer? Lord, if I could just lose a little weight, if, I, if my health was just a little bit better, or if I was young like I used to be, and we think there are all different kinds of challenges and all different kinds of problems that we face, and if we just didn't have any of those, my, we could just fly. If God took away all of the different guides, fences and walls and roads and barriers out of your life, more than likely you would crash. Believe me. I'm trying to believe me. I want to believe me because I believe it's true. There's a clock you have to punch. There's a, a, a date that you have to make. There's a, an opportunity that you have to address. There's an appointment that you have to meet. There's a person you have to see about a dog, and there are things that constrain you, and they tie you in, and they channel you, and they funnel you, and you're getting pushed, and sometimes you feel like you're getting pulled. Now, there are bad influences, and there are things trying to get you, but there's nothing, however, in your life more strong than what you want to do, because you think that that's freedom. I want to be free to do what I want to do. And sometimes we think being connected or hooked to Jesus is a loss of our freedom. Let's go on to another picture here. I remember when I was a little boy, my mom and dad got me a train set. I don't know, if, and I, listen, this was a train set. Now, I've seen what kids have for train sets these days. Even down there in Foodland and uh, over there in Foodland in Scottsboro, they have a train track that's mounted around the, up near the ceiling, and a train runs around it with a long, lots of cars and a caboose on it. Man, I had, there were tracks, and you put them together, and it was connected to a motor, and it had an engine that pulled the whole thing. That was really the only mechanical part. Everything else hooked to the engine, just like a real train. That thing probably weighed about five or ten pounds. You could hit your little brother over the head with that and leave him, he could be seeing stars. Man, that was, and it had, it's a, it was an engine. And, the, and the, the arms moved and the wheels turned. And you could even drop some little chemicals with the eye dropper down into the smokestack of that thing. And when it was going around, guess what it would do? It would smoke. That's a train. Put all my box cars to it, the flat bed, and the caboose at the end. Turn that power on and go round and round. That's all that. Round and round. And I could watch it for hours and hours and hours. Lots of powerful. That's obviously a steam engine right there. A real old-fashioned steam engine. But what would it be without tracks? I know what that train's thinking. I, I know a lot about kites and trains. They've been like, what they're, what's on their mind? I know that train's thinking. I want to go over yonder. I want to get free of these tracks. But guess what happens? You know what the worst thing in the world when we talk about train disasters? You know what, what the words we use to describe what happens what, when something bad happens to a train? What happens to it? It derails. It goes off the tracks. That's the worst thing to happen to a train. And that train's thinking, boy, I want to go somewhere else. I want to go somewhere where there ain't no tracks. I want to go where I want to go, not just where these tracks go. Well, can you see what I'm talking about? Sometimes we think, well, I'm just stuck. I got to go here. I'm hemmed in. I'm not even free to do whatever I want to do. Well, friends, trains can go all, all across the country. 
they've got to go where the tracks are. The tracks are the things that actually give it the possibility of being a train and doing what trains are supposed to do to fulfilling the reason that it was made to be a train. Tracks are indispensable. We've got to have them. You and me. Let's look at another one. Danny's got all kinds of things. He can charge it. He has, he, with his fixing things, he, he has all kinds of tools that are cordless. But most of my tools are like this. You've got to have them plugged in. My lamps are kind of like that. My computer, you got to have them plugged in. Ned's shopping for a laptop computer. He's wanting to get him one that he can take around. And it connects wirelessly to the internet. has a battery in it. He can take that computer anywhere he wants to go. He can go to a car show and hold that thing in Palm's hands. There might be information about this car right, right there while he's watching. Do anything, take it to the living room, watch TV, and uh, work on his computer. But in our world today, most of the things, most of the electrical appliances or tools that we use have to be plugged in. And when you unplug them, you say, let's get free, let's get loose. If it doesn't have a battery charger in it, you unplug that drill right there, and it won't do anything. It won't do anything. Our power, our energy, and our resources often come from being connected to God. It limits us, yes. It, it channels us. It, it, it directs us. It's the way He leads us. But we need not chafe at that. Or we need not feel like an animal that's been bridled. You know, over in the Psalms, the psalmist said, don't be like the ox or the mule. He said, they have to put a bit in their mouth to make them go where you want them to go. He said, God wants to guide you with his eye. God wants to guide you. In other words, it's like a parent. You ever had a parent give you the eye? You know that mean, that evil eye? You'll know you're doing a good job raising your kids if you can just look at them with that look. Or you can look at them and then look over here where you want them to go and they'll say, oh, daddy wants me to go sit down. Daddy wants me to be quiet. God says to the psalmist, don't be like an ox or a mule. Have to be led around with a bit of a bridle. Figure out how to grow up enough and become mature and have wisdom and understanding to know that God just wants to guide you with his eye. He just wants to look at you and you can tell by looking at his face what he wants you to do. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> I know, have y'all bought y'all's firecrackers yet? Well, I hope so. But if you wait a day or two more, you just feel there to just almost be giving them away. If you want to buy them on Thursday, you buy about as many as you can afford. Firecrackers. Fireworks. That ain't, ain't, I don't shoot them much anymore. Boom. You know the way I am. I almost contemplate bringing firecrackers sitting off here in church this morning. Y'all ever heard of what an M80 is? I don't know if you can get M80s anymore. They probably have something they call it an M50 or an M150 or something like that to make old people like me think, well, that's probably like what we had when we were kids. Listen, they don't make anything like we had when we were kids. It's illegal. You have to have a license. It was like dynamite. Cherry bomb. A cherry bomb. I don't know what was about it, but it was, it was dipped in something. It was, it was just, and you could drop that thing in water, which... What water would you want to drop it down into? We can take it down to the creek and boy, it'll make water jump up eight or ten feet in the air. But the best place in the world is to put where? In the toilet. That's right. Put it in the toilet. That's where it goes best. Woo! Now think. Just once. Yeah, just one time. That's all it'll do. And it's this kitty bar's door. Which I don't know what that means either. But you know, we didn't just want to light it. Throw it out there on the ground. I want to put it underneath a put it underneath a one of those aluminum trash cans. <coughs> Ten, nine. I don't even know when it's going to go. Boom! That trash can will go flying through there. Put it in somebody's mailbox. I take notes here. I know you're getting good ideas because it's not a because we understood something about how that was made. 
It's got gunpowder in there, but you know gunpowder, or black powder, it doesn't pop. It doesn't explode. It doesn't go boom. You can sprinkle some out there right there and throw a match on it, and it's not going to blow up. It's not going to pop or bang or make a noise. What's it going to do? It just burnt. Leave a smoke trail. But what that is right there, it's just got just a little bitty, maybe a half teaspoon of black powder, and they wrap it up. They wrap it with paper. In a cylinder, that's what mostly what that is. It's just a tube of paper that's been wound. It's, it's not an empty cylinder. It is paper, cardboard, that's been wound very tight, and it compresses that powder, like putting it underneath the trash can, or in a pipe, or uh, you know, in a mailbox. Confinement is really what makes it go. You know what? We had a cousin who was a genius. And I, who, whoever would have thought of unraveling a black cat firecracker? I, who, but I saw him do it. And he would take a whole pack of black cat firecrackers and he would, he would unravel them. And, and it's a long piece of paper. And right in the center is that silvery gray looking powder. It's really not black powder at all. And do you, do you, when I was a child, I had no idea. Most of the fireworks that we got came from, from China. They claimed to have invented gunpowder, probably did. But you know what kind of paper was used in making their firecrackers that we had when we were kids? It was newspaper. And you unravel it, and it's, it's Chinese characters. It's a Chinese newspaper. And that was fascinating. But uh, we had a cousin, and he got him a whole big pile of powder, and he took some of our newspaper, and he rolled it up in there like that, and uh, made a huge firecracker. Now, let me tell you something about firecrackers. That if you ever happen to light a firecracker, throw it over on the ground, if fire just starts spewing out the end of it, it's not going to go pop. It's, it's, it's not wrapped well. There's a mistake. Somebody made a mistake. But if you'll go and slap your foot down on it and put some pressure on it, in other words, just stomp it, it'll pop. So my cousin made him a big old, it was about that big. And it, well, we were all standing around. We, we were trying to, he's either crazy or this is so much fun. I just can't imagine what's going to happen. And we thought, this is so cool. And he was our coolest cousin. But the, the fire started spewing out of that thing. And I'm sure he didn't even think about it. We just did it so many times. He didn't, he didn't plan. He didn't weigh it. But fire started shooting out of that and he went and stopped. Guess what it did? It exploded. And he went this way and his shoe went all the way completely on top of the house. And he, on, on that 4th of July, uh, all of us got to go to the mercy room. Come. <laughs> but that was even more cool than if it had worked. It was just, that was so cool. Remember that? I've never forgotten it. You've probably heard me tell it before anyway. It's because of the constraints, the, the tightness, the hold is what makes the firecracker work. Let's go on. Stand up. Our country, there's our 50 states. Every state has a border, a state line. That's because, to a certain degree, every state in the United States has the freedom among, we have our freedom and liberty here in the state of Alabama. We can do things in a different way than all the other states do it. We can make up our mind. We, we have freedom. You know why? Because we're a state. And our state is defined by borders. There's, there's uh, imaginary lines. When we go from one state to another, you don't see anything other than a sign. You're now entering the state of Tennessee. But when you're traveling around the country, you have to find out what can you do in California? What can you do in Mississippi? What can you not do in Tennessee? All, and, and often our laws are the same, but very often there are different laws. When my mom and daddy got married, they couldn't get married because they, was not, they didn't have their parents' consent. You had to get your parents' consent if you were a certain age. 
they could go over to Mississippi, and they did. They went to IU to Mississippi, and they got married because Mississippi evidently didn't care who you were or what your mom and daddy cared or nothing. And so mom, uh, Terry's mom and daddy went to IU. That's where they got married. States are different. Up above in our north, we're a different country than Canada. We're a different country than Mexico and all the other states and the countries below us. We're different. We do things in a different way. We have our own citizenship. We pledge allegiance to a particular flag. Let's go on and look at the next slide, Carter. Our country is governed in a way that is very unique. We have a constitution. We have a constitution. When they finished the constitution, they realized that the constitution all by itself made the government too powerful. They had just been under a king. And what it looked when they read the Constitution, they said, well, this sounds like all you're, all you're missing in the Constitution. All you're missing is a king. All you need is a king. Do you know that they were trying to persuade George Washington to be a king? He just flatly refused. He said, no, I'm not going to be a king. And he says, I'll stop anybody else from being a king. We don't need a king. It's not about that. But they said, look at the Constitution. And so they added something to the Constitution that changed the Constitution dramatically. They said, we need to amend it. And so they came up with some amendments to the Constitution. Those amendments became the most important part of the governmental system of the United States of America. Do you know what we call them? The Bill of Rights. Do you know where we get our rights from? From God. We don't get our rights from the president. We don't get our rights from a congressman. We don't get our rights from the governor or from the state or from the people in Washington. We have, they said, certain Unalienable rights. In other words, undeniable rights. You can't prevent people from having these rights because they come from God. They said, we've designed these rights and these privileges. And they said, they're not for everybody in the whole world. Therefore, only, they're only for, they can only be grasped or claimed by citizens of the United States of America. Only citizens. Legal citizens. It's a boundary. All of our laws. Do you know when someone in Congress writes a law? When a law is drafted and it is passed by both houses of Congress and signed by the President, there is one test that faces that law next. If anybody chooses to question the validity or the integrity of that law, you know what the main question about that law is after it's passed? Is it constitutional? That's right. Is that law constitutional? Now, for about the past 50 years, the Supreme Court of the United States has lost its mind. The Supreme Court, you see we have three branches of government. The executive branch, the administrative branch, and the judicial branch. The Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. Right now it's got eight people on it. Well, actually nine. Uh, Justice Kennedy announced that he's going to retire at the end of July. So it has nine now, it's going to have eight when it has to eat. And that's going to be fixed a lot sooner than anybody knows. Their job is really, really, really simple. And we've made the Supreme Court the most important thing in the entire world. It was never intended for the Supreme Court to be as important as it is. Here in the United States, our whole society either rises or falls in the hands of the Supreme Court. It was never intended to be that. Because they only have one job. They're only supposed to do one thing. 
They're not, you know, they're not like a circuit court judge or an appeals court judge. A, a member that sits on the Supreme Court of the United States, they're only supposed to do one, 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 one thing. And that's to look at every law that's placed on their desk and to decide, is it constitutional? They're not supposed to be making up policy and, and changing our country. Let me tell you what. If my prayers are answered as a U.S. citizen, and if things happen that could possibly happen in the Supreme Court in this year or the coming years, the Supreme Court will become very, very, very unimportant. And we won't be taking life and death and cultural issues and placing them in the hands of a few people for them to tell us how to live. Fewer and fewer and fewer things will go before the Supreme Court if changes are made that I'm praying for. I don't know what you're praying for about our country. But it needs to get back to the place where all they do is just one thing. Either thumbs down or thumbs up. It's either constitutional or it's not. They have no business supporting any kind of political platform or any kind of agenda or being liberal or conservative or being an activist or have an opinion about anything. When someone appears before the Senate Judiciary Committee to determine whether they're going to be passed on to the court, a person, a candidate who's being questioned about his possibility of serving on the Supreme Court, every answer to every question ought to be, I don't know. What would you do? I don't know. What would this happen? I don't know. Because he's not supposed to know. He's not supposed to have he or she have their mind made up and already know what they're going to do. That's why they, what do they call them? They're a judge. They don't call them made up their minds already. They call them judges. And if I was, I'm kind of expecting to be nominated, but I'm not sure. Probably not. If they were asking me, well, how do you feel about this? Well, it don't matter what I feel. It don't matter what I think. It doesn't matter who I voted for. Is it constitutional or not? Now, this is not, this is my 4th of July sermon. Let's go on. Let's, let's finish this up. It's about constraints. It's about tracks. It's about strength. It's about change. It's about Jesus being the Lord of your life. Because whatever's going on in our country, our politics, our world culture, culture, or U.S. culture, that's really not as important for you and me as whether or not Jesus is Lord and Master of our life. You see, Jesus was pinned. He was affixed. He was connected. He was nailed to the cross. And they said, he said he was the Son of God. If he is, let him come down from the cross and save himself. Jesus couldn't come down from the cross to save us. He had to stay nailed. He had to stay committed. He was tied down and tied up. Pinned down, nailed. He subjected and submitted himself to the cross for us. It wasn't about getting loose of the cross and being free. It was about staying on the cross and dying because that's what God wanted him to do. You see, friends, how important borders and boundaries are, guides and laws and rules, and God's will for our life. Being free as an American citizen for Christians is different because we know we're not free to do whatever we want to do. We're free to do whatever Jesus wants us to do. And that's the distinction of a U.S. citizen who's a Christian. You and I have the liberty and the freedom as an American citizen to do whatever Jesus wants us to do. We won't be arrested for it. We won't be persecuted for it. We might be criticized. We might be denigrated and culled out. We 
still have freedom as Americans. As a Christian, you and I have our own cross. Jesus said you have to take up your own cross. It's about being tied down, about being nailed up. It's about being on the tracks. It's not about doing whatever you want to do or whatever somebody else wants you to do. It's about what shall this man do? Jesus said, follow me. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm, we're not going to sing a hymn of invitation today, but I, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask Carter if he would. Carter, I believe there's a song on there. If you start a song and play it quietly, just something that's of an invitational nature.